Hello everyone and thank you for joining this Onc Live Peer Exchange video editorial series. This series features expert panel discussions and treatment challenges oncologists face in the care of our patients with metastatic breast cancer. My name is Dr. Adam Brusky. I'm professor of medicine at the University of Pittsburgh and associate chief of the Division of Hematology Oncology uh, as well as medical director of the Women's Cancer Center at McGee Women's Hospital uh, and the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute. I have the privilege of moderating today's discussion along with a distinguished panel of expert clinicians and expert clinical researchers in breast cancer. Our goal is to provide a range of expert perspectives on the clinical challenges that physicians who treat breast cancer patients may encounter. We'll discuss trial results from recent important trials in metastatic breast cancer and apply the lessons of these trials to a few case studies. These will give our panel an opportunity to exchange views on their approaches to the management of patients with advanced breast cancer in 2013. This video can all be found on OncLive.com. Today I am joined by Sarah Hurwitz, Assistant Professor and Director of the Hematology Oncology Breast Cancer Program at the UCLA Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Joyce O'Shaughnessy, Chair of the Breast Cancer Research Program for U.S. Oncology and a medical oncologist with Texas Oncology and Baylor Charles A. Sammons Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Edith Perez, Deputy Director of the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center in Jacksonville, Florida. Dr. Hope Rugo, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Breast Oncology Clinical Trials and Education Program at the University of California San Francisco Comprehensive Cancer Center. And Dr. Andy Seidman, Professor of Medicine at the Weill Cornell Medical Center and Attending Physician in the Breast Cancer Medicine Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Now let's get started. So what's new in 2013 in the detection, management, and treatment of metastatic breast cancer? Let's first begin with a look at some of the recent clinical trials in metastatic breast cancer. We'll start with trials uh, that talk about um, hormone receptor positive breast cancer, in particular uh, the use of fulvestran and other drugs. And Dr. Shaughnessy, can you describe the confirmed trial? Sure. The confirmed trial was a large phase three trial that we heard about at San Antonio from Angelo DeLeo looking at patients who were pretreated with endocrine therapy, either the tamoxifen or an AI. They weren't all AI pretreated. And the patients were randomized to 250 milligrams versus 500 milligrams of the fulvestrant. And the fulvestrant at 500 milligrams had a survival advantage. I believe it was uh, 26 months with the higher dose and 22 months, I believe it was, with the um, with the lower dose. So that was really quite a quite a good confirmation that we didn't have the dose right with the 250. We got, you know, 500 is what we really have to um, focus on. So that was practice changing. Of course, the label had already changed prior to that, um, but this was the, the, real, the real confirmation, so probably would have global implications. So, you know, in terms of um, first line now when you've got a survival advantage in the metastatic setting, does that mean that should be our go-to medication? So the Falcon trial is going to be looking at the 500 fulvestrin versus anastrozole first line metastatic. That's ongoing big phase three trial. We won't have the results of that for some time. So I think probably we can talk about that a little bit when we get into some of the cases. Sure. Well, I'd like to ask some of the other panel. I mean, I think that you know, it's fulvestrin, you know, it's a trial, it's a big trial, it's just about the dose. Is that really that important? I mean, is it important, Hope? What do you think? Oh, yeah, I, I really thought that it, it's kind of interesting because when the first data came out that led to the change in FDA approval, I thought, what's the big deal here? The difference is pretty small, you know? And uh, we started using 500 milligrams of fulvestrant with the 500 milligram load, and I had patients who hadn't responded to 250 milligrams of fulvestrant two years before who then responded for eight months. So although we always knew the dose was really a question with fulvestrant, I think the impact clinically was bigger than you saw from the initial data, and I think we saw that in the follow-up that uh, Angelo presented that really this made a big impact in our clinics. Now, from a patient standpoint, they don't like the two injections, but uh, now it's an effective drug, and then it was a drug which most of us gave for a maximum duration of three months. And I think the phase two results from the first study comparing the, this dosing of fulvestrant 500 versus anastrozole, showing that the fulvestrant was better. Um, 
is really kind of exciting and interesting. And it makes you wonder if maybe, although the po patients do not like to have the injections, you're ensuring compliance, right? Because you're giving it in the clinic as opposed to patients, patients maybe forgetting to, to take the medicine. <laughs> you just yeah, want to make don't. sure I'm taking the drug. <laughs> Andy, how many of your patients take two? I mean, I have a problem because people don't like to take two. They I, I hate would, it. I would say it's standard of care except for uh, perhaps the 40 kilogram woman who yeah, might the tiny still get 250. Mm. I, I do want to say that uh, I was kind of sold on PFS and OS wasn't something that I felt I needed to see because I think, uh, you know, we won't get into too long of a discussion about PFS and OS, but there's so many other chapters in the story for these women that um, it's nice to see OS, but the, the PFS difference was, was the enough. The PFS was better in the yeah. new Edith, presentation. Edith, you're, that you're always fantastic. into like how trials are designed, and you know the untold story a lot of times. How did people pick 250 to begin with? Do you know? I tell you, uh, I was going to actually get into this. You know, right. how did we, did we come up with the 500? Right. Uh, yeah, I'm curious. How did people do that? You know, initially there were some initial comparisons against AIs. One of them looked favorably against the AI with the 250, others did not look as positive. But really, w what led, I think, to the 500 were two things. Number one, the comparison of the Fulvestran 250 versus Examestane in the context of effect trial showing right. that there was no difference, so everybody was surprised. And number two was the evalu evaluation of pharmacokinetics, demonstrating that by using the lower dose, it would take too long for a patient to achieve steady right. state levels that were appropriate. So I think it was a combination of the effect data plus pharmacokinetic data that led then to the evaluation of the 500, which we now know is the right dose. Yeah, I just wonder, it's really interesting. I mean, they didn't have the pharmacokinetics when they first did this. I was well, kind of they did actually. I remember a yeah. very early advisory board after Fulvestrin was approved and we started using it and we're kind of under impressed. And looking at that data and thinking, well, wait, how did you really decide that was the MTD? And it's interesting because, I mean, years of approval of a drug at a dose which was uh, less effective. And it, I think it's educated all of us about the fact that you really have to question whether you've reached the MTD and how you define an MTD. Well, I think it's fortunate that we've hit on what we think probably will be the dose as we now start to do trials in combination with... Well, no, and that, that gets to really...